One label in the late 40s and early 50s came to really establish modern jazz and the bebop movement. And this label gets very little recognition today. This label formed by a giant of a Jew named Herman Lubinsky, who didn't really give a damn about the black man, documented some of the great names of the jazz age. Men that were referred to in one syllable names and in nicknames have lived on in infamy. Names like Bird, Diz, Kluke, Bags, Dex, Fats, Prez, and Cannonball. We're talking Savoy Records and what a legacy it is. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Uh, today we're going to try something a little different. I uh, want to present to you Savoy Records and give you some history, some context, uh, talk about some of the main faces behind the label, and then show you the first 100 releases they did in the 12,000 series on LP. Uh, it took me a long time to collect them. They're uh, tough to find. They've often never been reissued. So unlike Blue Note, where there's, there'll be 15 different reissues, a lot of titles from over the years from Japan, a lot of Savoy stuff hasn't been reissued ever. And uh, it's, it was never part of the OJC series or the Scorpio series. And so it's it's just they're, they're tough to find. But when you do find them, they're likely to be old. Uh, I believe Fresh Sounds in Spain maybe did some, and the Japanese of course have done some, but uh, it's a much more difficult label to collect. But like I said, you are collecting a lot of the older ones when you do find them, which is kind of what's fun. Uh, <clears throat> I want to first set the stage for you guys. Uh, New Work is found, uh, sorry, Savoy is founded in 1942 by a Jewish fella by the name of Herman Lubinsky. Uh, he was a Connecticut born and New Jersey Newark raised large Jewish fellow with a big attitude and didn't treat people very well and we'll dive into that more later uh, but in Newark New Jersey is where he decided to set up camp and for those of you not familiar with the New York area uh, Jersey City's across from the southern tip of Manhattan and Newark is south of Jersey City on the New Jersey side of the Hudson. And it was once a very important city on the East Coast. Uh, in the early part of the 20th century, it was a preeminent East Coast hub. The Elizabeth Newark Port is one of the largest ports on the East Coast. And it's one of the most high volume container ports in, in the Americas. Uh, <clears throat> this also meant that Newark was a destination for the Great Migration. And for those of you who don't know your American history, after the Second World War, or even before, as the Industrial Age kind of comes into its fruition, it led to a lot of job opportunities in the Rust Belt, in the northern uh, Great Lakes cities, Chicago, Dayton, Detroit, uh, Cleveland, Milwaukee. These cities filled up with African Americans from the South. And Newark on the East Coast was this large shipping center, which meant there was going to be a lot of dock work to be had. And so Newark undergoes an incredible transition. And I do want to throw some statistics at you. Uh, the city of Newark in 1930 had around 450,000 people, so around half a million people. It was a big city. Uh, by, and by the time uh, white flight has its uh, effect the city has shrank uh, 130,000 people left the Newark area between 1960 and 1990 and those are mostly upwardly mobile whites, Jews and Italians and there was riots in the city in 67 that were racially charged and some of the worst in American history and a lot of what was driving this white flight was this great migration of blacks into the Newark area 
looking for employment, looking for opportunity, escaping Jim Crow in the South. And uh, the white flight was also driven by the building of American interstates. Post uh, World War II, Eisenhower passed the interstate legislation and the greatest highway system in the world began construction. And it connected the great American cities and made that tissue between the cities, the sinew, the, the, the connectivity bones of those freeways, it allowed American urban sprawl to really happen. And the trucking, the commerce, it all changed so dramatically. It made a lot of things less centralized. Um, large container ports, large container trucking shipping yards often moved to suburbs for more space. Uh, the whites left the inner cities in, in the, by, the, by the millions leaving the inner cities largely to blacks and Hispanics. Uh, some cities were definitely more driven by blacks, some definitely had more of a Hispanic flavor, but those large white East Coast cities in America saw incredible dynamic shifts. Uh, in 1950, Newark was 82% white, including Jews and Italians, uh, and 17% African American in 1950. Uh, that number changed. The blacks went from 70,000 to 220,000, and now the city is over half black. It's 54% black nowadays. 25% uh, lives below the poverty line. So it's a city that saw incredible flux happening. And a guy like Herman Lubinsky is living in this mire. He sees the beginnings of white flight in the post-war years and he recognizes the demographic changes he sees the blacks coming in in thick numbers and sees a business opportunity and let's recognize Herman Lubinsky for that he saw an entire population that wasn't really being a recorded and B commercialized and sold for profits to be made and not only was he seeing these people here without a record industry to support them or to uh, entertain them he also he also saw the incredible talent that exists in the African American community much of which, as we've spoken about for the last few years, driven by the desperation of tyranny, the strain and stress of oppression, the absolute desperation created by poverty. It creates the blues. It creates a place for your soul to release itself. It's fear, it's tension, it's sorrow. And whether it was the black church or the blues, the black community had this uh, and it expresses itself in such dynamic ways white Americans whether they were Jews or Italians had never heard music done like African Americans were presenting it it had a joy a celebratory tone uh, it came with dance and rhythm and pulse it was electrifying even to a guy like Herman Lubinsky who was a 300 pound Jew with poor racial interactions. His history of racial uh, exploitation, it's, it's a pretty dire thing as we'll get into here. But <clears throat> this is what Tiny Price of the African American newspaper, the Newark Herald News had to say about him. There's no doubt everybody hated Herman Lubinsky. If he messed with you, you were messed. At the same time, some of those people, many of them from the Newark area, were the top singers and musicians. They would never have been recorded and exposed on record if he didn't do what he did. And so, without mincing words, he was a tyrant. He was, he put the musicians on edge if he was at the studio and they recorded on record to the point where Ozzy Cadena and some of the other important figures just didn't want Herman Lubinsky to be there. Uh, again, Newark is a city in great transition. Uh, 
it means there was probably some cheap rents and where Lubinsky studio offices were in, in, New, in Newark, I can't find any photos. There's really not a lot of information out there on Savoy on, on the internet, which is partly why I'm making this series about some of these labels so people can have a resource to learn about these great labels and what they did for the black community and for American history and posterity. We have a documentation now of the sorrow of chains. This music is a testament to a people overcoming and saying, in spite of my dire situation, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I will not fear in the face of my enemy. I'm gonna pick up my horn and I'm gonna dance. I'm gonna make you dance. I'm gonna make you thrilled, enamored. I want to bring you to the edge of ecstasy. And if I tickle you just right, I might even be able to embrace you. And that's in a spiritual sense, in a sexual sense, in a racial sense. The power of this music is omnipresent. So to the point where even the people, the figures in this industry, like the, the Phil and Leonard Chess in Chicago, who recorded a lot of the great blues records and, and some of the great jazz records on the Argo imprint, they did not treat the black artists well. Bob Weinstock at Prestige in New York didn't treat the black musicians well. And Herman Lubinsky is probably at the top of that list. Yet he still deserves some praise here because he did still take the time to recognize the talent, saw the business opportunity, saying this stuff is good to sell to probably both blacks and whites and Jews and Italians, all of which Newark had in spades. So I'm gonna sell these race records and if nothing else, Italians and Jews have some recognition of how it feels to be outsiders, but there's gonna be more and more African Americans here over the next decades where I could probably make a good living on this. So in 42, he embarks. Uh, he has a few important partners along the way that we want to highlight. I want to talk about Teddy Rieg, first of all. Uh, Teddy Rieg was a 300-pound Jew as well. Uh, he was born and raised in Harlem, and he spent some of his time in the Harlem churches hearing black music. And so he decided he wanted to be an A&R, a producer, and get into the music scene. And he convinced Lubinsky to hire him. Uh, he works for Savoy from about 45 to 1950, 51. And he was an important figure there. Uh, he's the guy who brings Charlie Parker into the studio first. Miles Davis first. Uh, again, Savoy, as little as we recognize this label today how some of the greats in this music's history some of the greats and I'm just going to read off the list and I'm just going to use some nicknames here just for fun Bird Miles Getz Diz Dex Kluk Bags, Fats, Prez, Cannonball. This is the personalities of these young African American men. They all had nicknames. They all were enamored and embodied within these personas. Prez became Prez. See what I'm saying? Cannonball looked like a cannonball. Uh, it's just a fun assemblage of some of the great jazz royalty. And like I said, uh, Teddy Reeg himself was responsible for a lot of early bird, uh, Sarah Vaughn, Don Bias, Errol Garner, J.J. Johnson, uh, Lester Young, Johnny Smith, uh, Bud Powell. Uh, he ends up going on to Roost Records in 1951. And there's where he records Johnny Smith and Bud Powell and uh, I believe... Someone else on this list as well was from his Roost years. And Roost is another important label that we're going to dive into at some time that Teddy Reeg founded himself once he departed Savoy. And I couldn't find any information on it, but I think he and Lubinsky eventually had a falling out. 
because that sounds like how most of Herman Lubinsky's interactions ended. Uh, one of the sad footnotes of Savoy is all the great talent that they scouted and recorded, few of them ever stayed. And Herman Lubinsky is probably culpable in that. And it might not be the sole reason. I'm sure money drove them elsewhere. Uh, friends, band members, uh, the allure of Manhattan itself versus Newark. So I'm sure there's other factors at play. But very few of the greats that we think of stayed with Savoy for long periods of time. Uh, I'm going to get into the records here shortly so we can actually start looking at some of these great recordings. But Ralph Bass was another important figure. He was with Savoy from 48 to 52. He was a pioneer in the black community uh, with R&B production. He was a great talent scout. He brought Brownie McGee and Johnny Otis to Savoy. And this is more on the R&B side of things. And it comes a little later in uh, the Savoy discography. And th Ralph Bass ends up moving on to King Records and then on to Chess Records. And then Ozzy Kidena is another very important figure here at uh, Savoy. He was an Oklahoma City native. He moves to Newark as a young child. He goes to a lot of the black churches in Harlem and he ends up working at Herman Lubinsky's radio station. Because Lubinsky, Lubinsky was an entrepreneur. Lubinsky was a, in the music field. The label wasn't his first business. He had record uh, presses. He had record radio stations. And the label was another aspect of what Lubinsky wanted to dive into. And like they said, it's a pretty dominant race-driven uh, enterprise. They're capitalizing on this new black demographic that Newark has to offer. Uh, Ozzy Cadena was an A&R guy. He was with the label from 54 to about 59. Uh, and he brings guys like Cannonball, Milt Jackson, Yusuf Latif, Charlie Mingus, uh, the great Jimmy Scott, uh, and then he goes, I'm going out to pre Prestige Records because Esmond, Esmond Edwards left Prestige and went to Argo. And so uh, the great era of, of Savoy Jazz really exists from 45 when Reig, Teddy Reig starts recording Parker and Dizzy and Fats and Lester and Coleman Hawkins. And that exists during the 78 RPM era which when we start the 12,000 series, a lot of that gets reissued on the 12 inch LP in 55. And then as we start moving into the 50s, the 10 inch era comes and I'm gonna show you a few of the 10 inches with some photographs that I took. But then in 55, the LP era launches in earnest. And so 55, 56, where all hundred of these records come from, it's a lot of material condensed into a two year window. And they start mixing in the modern bebop and post-bop modernism. Even a little hard bop starts having formation at Savoy. But the record sales start diminishing strongly. And as jazz starts fading from the national landscape, the hope for a peripheral label like Savoy or Blue Note to make it rich and have hits becomes greatly diminished. So a lot of labels start shifting towards R&B, towards gospel, and as we move into 58 and 59, which is actually past what we're gonna to cover today, they start getting a bit more of the experimental jazz. Some of the Charles, not Charlie Mingus, but uh, Yusuf Latif, uh, Wilbur Hardin. They start getting a little more experimental. Cecil Payne, uh, and then jazz slowly starts to fade and the label becomes predominantly a uh, gospel-driven label by 1960. And then they do sprinkle in some avant-garde, edgy stuff, so early Sun Ra, early Paul Bly, and again, these records did not sell at all. And the label's de-emphasizing its jazz promotion by 60, 61, 62. And so there are some great titles that come post 12,100. And we'll, de we'll delve into them at some point. I'm still missing four of the next 60 records I'm trying to find. Two of them I can't even find. Uh, three of them I can't find right now. The other one, I have a later issue, uh, a Tanganyika record by Wilbur Hardin. No, not Tanganyika, sorry. Uh, Jazz Way Out is a Wilbur Hardin session 
1960 or so, uh, maybe 59 even, probably 59, and Coltrane's on it. It was released as Coltrane on Dial Africa, and it's just a reissue of this Savoy session. And I've always had the Col- Coltrane reissue, so I never bought the Savoy one because it cost a lot of money. But I do want to finish it to have that Savoy catalog. So when I do find those four, I'll do part two to the Savoy set. But again, the sales of those records was so minimal, which is partly why they're very expensive and hard to find. I tried to bid on the Yusef Latif I'm missing the other day, and it went for 400 bucks on eBay. So that's a little bit out of my price range. Unfortunately, uh, if somebody wants to donate me a copy of Yusef Latif, the Dreamer, I'd be happy to, to accept that. <laughs> Uh, all joking aside. So, and then the, the last real important component of the Savoy Newark experience is Rudy Van Gelder. And so you have Lubinsky's entre- entrepreneurial spirit and business acumen, and he's the kind of guy that can make a handshake deal and squeeze your hand so hard that any idea of going back on your conditions would be dismissed quickly. So Savoy, he, he does have that business acumen. And then Teddy Reek has the, the, fi, the, the, the fine-tuned uh, talent scout and a recognition of what's going on in the New York scene and the beboppers. So he brings them to Lubinsky. You probably wouldn't have ever looked at those guys otherwise. I do want to read a quote here about Lubinsky. This was also said. He's been described as an arrogant bully the quintessential loudmouth, overweight, cigar-smoking record man with little apparent charm. As a colorful character endowed with a shrewd business sense and as a rather profane cheapskate who had a low opinion of many of the musicians that he recorded and who was best known for his desire to cut expenses at all costs. His oldest daughter, Lois Grossberg, later said he was paranoid about money. It consumed him like a burning fire. He had a reputation as an ogre in the business. You have no idea of the cheapness. So that's his own daughter paraphrasing him at the very end. And that's pretty harsh criticism from your own blood. And it's none of the musicians loved him. You know, and like I said, I'm sure it made it easier to escape to a blue note when that opportunity arose. And about Teddy Riga, I want to read these few things. A 300 pound plus six foot Jewish promoter born in Harlem, raised among the thieves and geniuses of the jazz world. An impassioned fan who mastered the art of networking at an early age. Uh, in 45, Reed produced the first recordings of legendary bebop Charlie Parker. Had he done nothing else, said Reed, Reed biographer Edward Berger, this accomplishment alone would have ensured his place in history. Um, and also here, there is no question that much of this wonderful jazz would have gone unpreserved had not Rieg interrupted his small-time 52nd Street hustles to become an artful bridge between musicians and the money men like Lubinsky needed to see at a recording session, wrote jazz columnist Nels Nielsen. And so these are the characters behind this legendary but often overlooked label. Teddy Rieg and Lubinsky really create a legendary stable of recordings and artists and, and musicians. And the era of jazz that most of us know, kind of post kind of blue, Savoy's now on the outside looking in and about to transition to making gospel records. But Rudy Van Gelder, like I said, is that last important figure to discuss. Most of you are going to be well familiar with Rudy Van Gelder. He had a studio in, in Hackensack, New Jersey. He worked uh, with Blue Note a couple days a week, with Prestige a couple days a week, and with Savoy a couple days a week. And the artists and musicians from those labels cross over. They met each other. They ended up working together in other projects. And a lot of them move on to Prestige and to Blue Note from Savoy. And let's also remember that Savoy was the first one to record the Newark law firm of Morgan, Mobley, and Bird. Three of the great Blue Note stable giants all had their start recording for Herman Lubinsky and, and the Savoy enterprise. 
and all moved on to Blue Note for a long time and really made their name there. So that wraps up the background of Savoy. Now we're going to start diving into the records themselves. Okay, <clears throat> so I prepared a number of photographic slides. I took all the sleeves off these first 100 records and photographed them, jackets without the plastic sleeves out so there wouldn't be the glare, so you could see them. Plus I have a lot of notations on these sleeves, so I wanted you to be able to see the records on this side as I present them to you on this side. And it took me a while to figure out how I was gonna do this, but I hope this works. So this is Charlie Parker 12,000. Recorded by, of course, Reed. Ozzy Cadena is on this, as is Rudy Van Gelder. No, actually, I don't think Van Gelder's here yet. But even Van Gelder, a lot of these old sessions, ends up doing the remastering for the 12 inch re releases. But these are old recordings from 45 and 46. Uh, Miles Davis, Max Roach, uh, can't read that. Tiny Grimes, Tommy Potter, uh, Bud Powell, that's what that says. Uh, this is from 1947, 46. Number 12,000, number 12,001, again, is more Parkers. Uh, Miles Davis is about 19 years old in these sessions. These are from 45, and early Parker. The next record I want to show you is Errol Garner, who was a Pittsburgh native. Uh, this record's huge. Uh, but Errol Garner's career was huge. He sold a lot of records at Columbia. A uh, brilliant player. Wonderful old cover copy of that. Uh, these are mostly solo sessions, if I remember correctly. This was the second cover of this. They had color to a lot of jackets at some point. This is the next record, number 12,003. And it's also Errol Garner. And that's also the second cover. I don't have the original cover of that. Uh, this is Mary McPartland, 12,004. Uh, she plays with Vinnie Burke on some of these and Joe Morello. And on the other side, it's Eddie Safransky and Don Lamond. So nice little groups on that. This is more Mary McPartland. This is from the Lullaby of Birdland. The other one was from the Hickory House. This is Telefunken Blues, which is originally just a Kenny Clark record. Uh, Milt Jackson, Percy Heath, Frank Morgan. Frank West, Walter Benton. It's from two different sessions. There's a lot of bassy musicians on this record. It's pretty outstanding stuff. And the young West Coast Frank Morgan is on fire on the side that he's on. Uh, Frank Morgan was supposed to be the next coming of Charlie Parker, but the mantle, the crown was too heavy to wear. And he ended up having a lot of problems, spent a lot of time in jail. This is a great record. Kenny Clark and the great Ernie Wilkins. Ernie Wilkins is another uh, Basieite. Uh, on this record, you have Eddie Burt, Cecil Payne, Hank Jones, Wendell Marshall, Kenny Clark, and uh, again, it's produced by Ozzy Cadena and Rudy Van Gelder mastered and engineered it. This is uh, Errol Garner, some more work of his. On one side is Billy Taylor, and Billy Taylor is playing with Jimmy Crawford and Al Hall. And then on the other side, he's playing with Milt Page, John Simmons, and Shadow Wilson. Nice two piano stuff. This is Charlie Parker Memorial. This stuff's from uh, 1945 as well. and has some miles on it. And then that wraps up the first 10 Savoy. I'm moving on to number 2010. This is the great J.J. Johnson and Kai Winding. Uh, Teddy Reed came over and he wanted to record J.J. Johnson, who was somewhat of a phenomenon, and they recorded them fairly early on together. It's outstanding sessions. Uh, on side one, you got Billy Bauer, Charlie Mingus, Wally Cirillo, and Kenny Clark. On side two, you have Leo Parker, Hank Jones, Al Lucas, Lou Stein, and uh, Shadow Wilson. And if you notice why Kenny Clark's name, not name, there's a number three there, and that indicates that's the third time he's shown up and he's going to show up a lot. We're gonna keep a Kenny Clark meter running here. Uh, this is uh, Kluke, sorry not Kluke, Fats. Fats Navarro, number 20, I think it was 11, yes. And this has three different sessions, but it includes Sonny Stitt on some of it, Kenny Clark, Bud Powell, Tad Dameron, Curly Russell, Kenny Dorham, and many more. So some great early recordings right there. 
This next one is a Jazz West Coast concert, and it's got uh, some incredible bands on it, some incredible players. Howard McGee, Sonny Chris, Hampton Hawes, Barney Kessel, Wardell Gray, Dexter Gordon, well worth seeking out. 2013, 12,013, sorry, is this fantastic Coleman Hawkins session. And I'm not exactly sure what year this is from. Uh, it comes out in 55, but I, I found out so far that Leo Blevins plays guitar on some of it, and Les Strand plays the organ on some of it, and apparently Sun Ra might play piano on a couple tracks, but I, I can't really find dates for when this was recorded. I'm gonna guess it's probably 47, 48, but I'm not positive. More Parker with Miles from 47. So they recorded a lot of Parker sides. Uh, this is the great Eddie Burt. And Eddie Burt is a fantastic trombone player. He won a lot of polls when he first started arriving on the scene. He was a very dexterous player. And again, the Whites always had a lot more power in sales, and thus they won a lot of the polls. If anybody ever beat Jimmy Jimmy Cleveland or J.J. Johnson, I don't know what they're doing. But again, the band here is Wendell Marshall, Hank Jones, and Kenny Clark. And those three piano, bass, and drums back a lot of Savoy records. And so you're going to see Kenny Clark's name and Hank Jones especially his name show up a lot here. This is Mary McPartland and George Shearing. They each share a side, two of the great piano players of that time. That record was reissued with a color cover not long after. It's got the second Oxblood label versus the red Savoy logo that we see on most records. Then this Cafe Bohemia record is an awesome record, number 12017. And it's got an incredible lineup with Nat Adderley, Horace Silver, Cannonball, Donald Byrd, Paul Chambers, and Jerome Richardson. This is the first foray, really, of hard bop happening at Savoy. Of course, Max Roach and Clifford Brown are setting the world on fire in Chicago. And that's definitely in tune with what's happening there and on par with that. The next great session is a record 12018 for Cannonball Adderley. His brother Nat's on it. Uh, it's also got Paul Chambers, Hank Jones, and Kenny Clark. This was the second cover. Again, they gave a color a cover, a color cover to it down the road. And that original Cannonball cover was the record I bought before Christmas. Because I wanted to show you the real cover on this one. And it's take, it took me till this past week for it to finally show up. I just, but I wanted this one in the in the in the sequence. It was important to me. Uh, this is number twelve nineteen encore. Eddie Bird again, the trombone player, and I believe that's the great uh, J.R. Montrose on the cover with him, who you don't see a lot of, uh, who makes a great record at Blue Note. Um, this is Bird's second record for Savoy, and Joe Puma is on some of this. Clyde Lombardi, Kenny Clark, Hank Jones, J.R. Montrose. So great recordings, and that wraps up. The second 20 records. So next here, we got some Dizzy Gillespie. It comes from six different sessions. Number 1220, 12020. Uh, and like I said, it comes from five different sessions. They compiled it from the 78 era into this 12 inch LP, Groove and High. This also comes with a black cover where the image is kind of inversed. Next is the great Nat Adderley, Cannibal's brother who's actually one of the most fiery cornet trumpet players in the business. And he plays bebop and hard bop as fierce as anybody out there. He's in the lineage of Clifford Brown and Freddie Hubbard. Very dynamic, bright, virtuoso, uh, confrontational, agitated, aggressive. You gotta love Nat Adderley. He's more aggressive than Hubbard or Clifford Brown. Clifford Brown seems almost relaxed doing that lightning, those dancings that he does. And Hubbard's always seems very under control. He seems more agitated as he's dancing through those long changes. Uh, Ernie Wilkins makes another record here. This is with Frank West, Jerome Richardson, Hank Jones, Eddie Jones on bass and Clint Clark. So again, you're seeing some Count Basie lineage there with Wilkins West.